Okay, we're ready to go. Uh, so our final lecture, or let's say final review, no cheating, no new material, just uh, going over what we've learned uh, this, uh, this semester uh, today. So you, you have a chance to, to ask any questions you like, but uh, let's start first with logistical questions. So anything uh, unclear about the homeworks, exams, Three grades, anything. I have a question the final exam. Is it going to be something that we have open notes that we can look at and go through it? Yeah. So I, if if the midterm worked for, well, worked well for you, I will not change the the setup. So meaning that it will be on grade school, uh, but in class. Uh, and uh, this time, uh, we will randomize seating. So essentially, I will ask you. I will assign a seat. To each of you, I will distribute the assignment. It's a little bit complicated because in this room there is no, there, there are no numbers for whatever reason, or at least I don't see them. Maybe you do see, and then you will, you will see it at, at a specific predefined location. And I will ask you to verify your neighbors. So the first question will be: My neighbor on the left is such and such. My neighbor on the right is such and such. My seat is this and this. Uh, just to enforce the fact that people cannot show up, sit together, and collaborate which we've seen during the midterm. Uh, that's the uh, one thing. So show up a little. I mean, it's an early exam. I think it's eight or something, right? Uh, yeah. So show up a little early. Don't forget, try to bring your ID. There is always a way to verify you. I mean, show me a page, LinkedIn page with your photo. <laughs> Let's see how it flies. Uh, yeah, university page. So don't worry about it. So if, if the setup worked well for you, we'll do that. Yeah, so everything is open, but you cannot search on the internet. No chat GPT, and maybe we'll forbid some other tools, tools like maybe some compiler tools. But most likely something like OpJDump and stuff. I'll be more explicit about it, depending on what questions I will ask. That's good? OK. Specific what? Uh, you see the assignment? No, the, uh, the tools? The size of, yeah. No, I will probably just list it in the question just to make sure that like something is not allowed or something like that. Okay. So I we released another extra credit assignment uh, about the file systems. So we didn't have time to, to squeeze it into the class, but you're welcome to do it. And I forgot what, how, how much extra credit we would give for that, but, but some number. And I, I can adjust it a little if you feel like it deserves more. So you have time, I think, until next Tuesday or something to finish it. So if you feel like you want a better grade, do this. Another thing, so I was suggested that to, to raise the, the level of participation in this in a class feedback, we will, which is probably quite common in other classes these days. So if we all reach 75% of participation on the class feedback, I'll give you some number of credits, some significant number, maybe like 2% 2, 2 of your grade, which is huge kind of. So, but then everyone has to participate, 75%, right? So, which is achievable goal. So like, uh, you just have to ping your peers. I will, I will send an announcement for that. So is, is, that, is, that, is that what people do or you seem to be funny about? Well, I don't know, university asks us. I mean, I'm also curious because usually, I mean, I get obviously strong opinions, like people say, ah, you suck because, you know, like I really got upset about this class and I, I, I'll write a review. But let's give a chance to everyone uh, to get a more, more kind of like uniform distribution of worlds. Uh, what else? So this uh, last homework is due today. We moved it, right? So today is no penalty. You can submit, right? And I will have my office hours at one uh, as usual. So you can come ask, come talk. If you need, if you really want to talk to me this week more, I can set up more office hours if you need, if you suddenly, you know, one day before, before the exam, you have like 10 questions for me. I will try to answer. Okay, good for now. Okay. Um, regarding the material, I'm assuming the, the final exam is cumulative, correct? Yeah, correct. We'll it's cover correct. everything, but we'll be shifted towards the, towards the, the second half, but I expect that you understand everything at this point. 
And this is what I will try to walk over. I mean, we will discuss how can we can build an operating system in this one, one and a half hours or one and a quarter hours, which we have. And hopefully, you know, this kind of higher level view will help you. This is something what you can take take away with you. And uh, if someone says, okay, I, I need to, I need to be, I need you to build an operating system and you know like it's surprisingly how often this kind of shows up later in life so for example if you work on I don't know you know some cloud stack software and they use uh, WebAssembly today to isolate pieces of code untrusted pieces of code like imagine you want to run something at near native speed you know JavaScript doesn't cut it you know, no matter which framework, which compiles to JavaScript doesn't cut it. And so they say, okay, like, let's build a WebAssembly framework, which might be largely hidden from you because what you do is that you say, uh, well, I wrote it in SEAL and in Rust and it just compiles to WebAssembly, right? But the problem is that often there is no operating system. There is no, There are no system calls because you're running inside the web browser, almost like on bare metal, right? And then you say, look, ah, I got it. So I will quickly build my file system. I will take it from X plus six and let's see what happened. Remember, Intel engineers did it for the management engine. They took it from Minix. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So let's uh, let's try to recap what is that we, we've learned. So we'll be using this, uh, the other drawing tool, which is uh, kind of a little bit more convenient. So remember what we started doing after the, after the midterm. So everything starts with uh, essentially a CPU in a clean state, which just essentially just resets and a bunch of things are running, which, you know, only security experts care about. And I, I, mean, I was trying to explain that, okay, it's worth paying attention. So the operating system is not the first thing which, uh, which runs on the system, but the protocol eventually, so there is a, like a tiny piece of memory, which is called, uh, it's a read-only memory where the BIOS sits, right? And you see my, you see my handwriting here, right? And so the CPU eventually loads this, uh, runs this BIOS in memory. And what the BIOS is doing eventually, it says, okay, look, I will go to the disk and I will take a, a sector number zero. And like, after looking at the file systems, we kind of understand that, okay, this is how we address, uh, address things in a file system. So if this one is 512, uh, bytes. So this guy just buys just as okay. I'll you know, load it to, to in memory at a specific location, which is uh, do we remember what which one? Good, good, good. Seven C zero zero. So some people are already like you know like Google interview. What is like where does the BIOS load the boot sector? Seven C zero zero. Yeah, okay, you passed. Uh, so and this is your memory, right? This is how the world starts on x eighty six, and uh. I mean, you don't have to be super specific. Uh, I mean, I'm specific just because I want you to run, to boot a, a real operating system, which boots on real hardware. If you run inside the web browser, the protocol might be similar, might be different, but conceptually it will be similar. So something initially will load a bit of, bit of software which you have control of, right? And this, this bit of software is called a boot block. Boot block uh, or bootloader. And it starts running. So this is this is the first thing under your control, right? And remember, we're still running in physical addresses, right? So we only the machine is is still in 16-bit mode, and it can only address obviously up to two to the power 16, which is 64 kilobytes, right? So not much. And so what you what you're doing in the very first thing on x86 and on ARM, it's it, it's very similar. Is uh, you say, okay, sure, I will switch this machine to something more powerful. And uh, we switch to 32-bit mode, but switch to a 64-bit mode is very similar. Again, you can read up our uh, tutorials online and it, it will be almost the same, right? And here, we, there is a little bit of this, of, this uh, of how the CPU works, which is not super convenient to us because it's all for backward compatible reasons of so the segmentation and uh, stuff, right? And we say, look, we're gonna first set up segmentation and then set up page tables because in the end, what we want on modern machine is to control memory in the in terms of page tables, right? So those four kilobyte pages, right? Uh, and pages, by the way, remember, they can be of different size. So which sizes do you guys remember? Which sizes are supported on 32-bit machines? 
four kilobyte and four megabyte, right? And there is like, if you ever forget, and okay, I, I do forget myself because there are so many different uh, page table layouts, right? It always kind of adds up nicely because in the end, what you're doing is that you take four kilobyte page and you split it into equal chunks, right? On 32-bit machines, you will split it into 32-bit chunks, right? Four byte chunks. On 64-bit machines, you split it into eight byte chunks because the addresses are larger, right? So, and then that defines the layout of page table, right? So it's either uh, like on 64-bit machines, the, the page sizes will be, will be what will be four kilobyte, two megabyte, and one gigabyte, right? And that's that's enough, so to to cover most cases, right? So okay, so anyway, so we 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 set up the segmentation, and our segments, are, um, like it's it's a data and a code segment. They cover everything starting from address zero, right? And uh, both of them, and going to four gigabytes, zero to. 4 GBs before because 4 GBs is 2 to the power 32 minus 1, right? Uh, okay, cool. And on top of that, we say, okay, like we're ready to boot, right? And uh, remember how we do this. Since we only have so much code here, we only have 5, 12 bytes of code. It's kind of some kind of like, it looks like a competition. So how much stuff you can fit into the 5, 12 bytes of code, right? Uh, and the answer is not much, but what you're doing is that you say, look, I have enough so I can implement a tiny disk driver, which allows me to read and write disk, right? And what we do here is that we say, okay, look, we got it. So we're gonna go and load something from disk, right? And this something is, the, is our kernel, right? And again, we pick this location, which is uh, starts at one megabyte and essentially just load the kernel here, right? Remember this. And we go up until like end symbol, right? And uh, that's how we start booting. And again, at this point, we say, okay, we got it. So it's a, it's a remember, like it's it's a minimal elf loading. So everything is already linked, compiled and linked statically, right? So it's one blob of one blob of uh, code and data and other sections, right? But you control how it's built because you can you can use your linker scripts and make files to make sure that this thing can run specifically at at which address actually good good question at what address it is linked right right so it actually it's it's not linked to run at one megabyte right it's linked to run at two gbs plus one mb right and it just it just a it's just a detail, but again, uh, you can design the kernel in many different ways, and you can say, look, my processes will be running uh, maybe starting at second gigabyte, but again, for maybe for you can argue, but for backward compatibility reasons or for some other reasons, they design the system x v six in such a manner that the address space of a process will look something like that, and we. We've seen it many, many times, right? So it's split in, in half, right? And the bottom part is, is the user part, right? And the upper part is the kernel part, right? And so we say like our kernel will be sitting always actually here. This is the kernel. And uh, that's why it's linked to, to run here at two GBs plus one MB, right? And here we will be loading processes, right? An important, an important takeaway here is that the kernel is just, it feels like almost the program which you write for any other homework assignment. It has main, it, it feels like a C program, right? But we need to do a little bit of wrapping to make sure that it actually starts correctly, right? And, and that's why part of our kernel, right, has a tiny, tiny bit of assembly code, which uh, essentially does, okay, I will, again, I will, set up the initial page table because like it's okay to run with segmentation but really uh well to be honest again it's a design choice you can defer you, i don't i don't think you need a page table really right now still you really need 
pitch tables when you start running processes, right? Because the reason is that the high level design goal is that each process will have its own address space. Each process, when, it, when I say it, I mean, each process will have its own address zero. And you can, you can play those tricks with segmentation. And as, as I was saying, if you start digging deeply into the X with six uh, commit history, you will find a version which runs without page tables. I'm pretty sure I remember I've seen it. And so if you go and you, you will find that, okay, back in the days, they, they did not use a page table for whatever reason, right? So they decided, okay, like, let's just try it. I don't know really what the reason was, but really up until now, you don't really need a page table, but we originally, we, we do, we do have, we do create a tiny page table, which is a four megabyte page table, which only covers two regions, right? So I will use green, for example, it covers the region from, from let's say zero to, to four megabytes and from two GB to two GB plus four MB, right? And it's still just part of the boot process, right? But the moment you set up the page table, right? So you say, look, I'm fully running in, in, a, in a protected mode, my CR3 register, which is a hardware register, which keeps the track of a root of a page table uh, is initialized. I can flip a bit, I can run, right? And so it like, essentially you say, I'm running here inside my main function, right? So roughly speaking, this is, this is part of your like early boot stage. This is your goal here is get to main as, as fast as possible and forget about it, right? So are there any questions like this? This part is a little like low level and mundane, right? So not really, not really like, not really that interesting to a degree, right? So it's interesting to, for complete understanding, for completeness, I guess, but like it can be different in different kernels and stuff like that, right? But uh, let me ask you a question. So any questions about this early boot initialization? It's loaded at the first megabyte. And the reason it's done is that some part of this memory is occupied by bias. So if you write something in this memory, something might happen on the machine, right? So uh, it might be a character or like a hello world, uh, which you write H and it shows up in a frame buffer and eventually shows up on a screen, right? And so, and the convention was that addresses, specific ranges of addresses were used by bias, but nothing was used above the first megabyte. That's why we loaded the first megabyte. And we do remember when we run this early assembly, we translate all the virtual addresses into physical addresses, but effectively what we're doing there is that we subtracting this two gigabyte, right? Because everything is linked at two gigabyte plus one, but we are running at one still, right? And then, and then we do this, do a, do a jump to, to two, two gigabytes plus one. Uh, so I know the theory of this is mostly for like the X and six stuff, but um, with the more complicated the BIOS and the system become, is it still true that always have a one gigabyte or does it shift? No, like uh, BIOS, those addresses are regulated by the, by the standard. Like that's, that's why we call them PC, right? I mean, I'm not an expert on standards to be honest, but uh, no, it's always under like above the first megabyte, it's free. People do different design choices, but this is pretty typical. So the reason I'm so like, why I teach all this low level stuff is that uh, Linux works pretty much similar. I mean, they do like, it's harder to read because it, it will boot on ARM, it will boot on anything, right? On every like, bit of like almost everything what you could find in this room, right? So it gets a little complicated, but uh, really the core part is the same. And at some point you look at this code and see, okay, I've seen it before. It was, it was way simpler, but if you have the gist of what's going on, then you can quickly learn how other kernels boot. So people do different things. So in, in like one of the kernels, which we've built a uh, couple of years ago, since we, it was all clean slate. We didn't have a reason to, to say that user processes start at address zero. They could start anywhere. So we just loaded that first megabyte and left it there. So we never relocated or moved it anywhere else. There was no reason, at least at that point. So we, we just left it there. Is the frame buffer in this BIOS area? Yeah. But, but the frame buffer should need more than one megabyte, I think. Uh, 
Good question. So, I mean, what I, it, I think it's a frame buffer for this standard, which is called CGA or something like that, right? So it's the one which we used in our homework assignment where we're, when we were doing Hello World. That one is there. And that's why, and I mean, I don't know the details because I never really bothered to look, but for example, on this laptop, I cannot do the CGA thing because the BIOS doesn't support CGA or something, or I cannot find it. So maybe it's supported, but just like buried deep inside. And so it, it just uses a different standard. I, and I don't know that standard. You're right. So like eventually you say, okay, but what about my GP, GPU, right? My powerful NVIDIA card. Obviously it will not fit there. No, it just, it works differently. Not too differently. Actually, I, it will also allocate memory for, for frame buffer and for whatever the command buffers you send to the GPU. And maybe there will be multiple standards and you probably know way better. You can send high level commands, right? And you can probably just uh, send row, row, row bits as well. I'm just guessing, right? So if you, but so that, that area will be allocated differently. There will be a standard which will explain the lay, layout of those data structures, but that can happen later. So any other questions? Okay, good. But at a high level, okay, the moment we reached main, uh, who can tell me what is that conceptually we want to do here, like in main? Let's imagine. Correct. So we need a uh, we need memory allocator. And X six does this trick that it says, okay, I essentially will start out if there is an end symbol, I will round it up to the next available page. And I will start adding pages uh, up to certain point. And originally it just does only up to four, four, first megabyte, uh, sorry, like up to two GBs plus four MBs because this is the only region which is covered by the original page table. And uh, to construct a better page table, we arguably need the memory allocator, right? And then after the boot is over, it adds additional pages that it will keep going and add all the pages up until the constant, which is fist top, which is uh, like two GBs plus this fist top constant, right? And in a real kernel, you don't typically do that, but instead what you, you either query the bias and the bias will tell you, okay, this is how much memory the machine has. And this is roughly the topology of it. Uh, uh, XM6 doesn't do that, although it's relatively easy to get this information from Grub. So most, most in the, again, in the last systems, which we, we didn't bother to, bother to query bias because, I mean, it's just pain, but uh, Grub does it for us. And Grub gives us this like, description of available memory in a, in a, in a more high, higher level format, right? So, so then we know like, okay, this is the memory and that's what we're doing, right? Okay, so we did the memory allocator. So it was something like kernel, uh, I forgot to something, kernel memory allocation in it. I forgot the name of the function, right? Uh, but you can probably look it up. Uh, uh, do, do we need it? Probably not, right? So so we, we get the memory allocator. So who can tell me how the memory, what, what, what is the possible, what is the organization of a memory allocator in XV6? Who remembers? It's a linked list and I will use a different color here. So the head of a list will be here in a data section of a kernel and it will point, uh, since you you keep adding to the front of the list, uh, the picture will be something like this points to the very last page which you added. And here there will be another element of the list, right? Which points here, which points here, which points here and so on, right? It's not ideal, but it has, it has it's not ideal for the reasons that uh, and the book talks about it that you you can only have you can only support up to close to up to two GBs of physical memory, right? Which has, for example, four GBs of DRAM. X plus six can only initialize with with two. Do we see the reason why? And no more than two. Oh, actually, I'm no, I'm I'm. And I'm lying, so it can, but uh, it cannot. It cannot provide more than two GBs of user memory, 
So it's another twist on this question. And it, this question is in the book, right? So I can show it to you so you know what we're talking about. Uh, let me just quickly do it. Uh, X with six uh, our book. Mm. Two GB. Hey, where is it? No, really? No search for me? Two GB. Uh, just remember, it's in questions. Does, did, did any of you uh, notice this question in the book? Yeah, where is it? Cool physical memory allocator. By the way, did you read the did you read the book? That's the question. It's good to read the book uh, for the for the exam. I mean, I, I. Which page? No, I, I, I did ask it. I remember, but I wanted to show it in a book because who cares about what I was asking in twenty twenty something, right? But where is it? Uh, it's a memory allocator. The funny part, of course, I, I might, I might fail. I might not be able to find it because I don't remember what exactly it was. Probably looping already. We could potentially loop. Uh, exercises. So some of you. Those are good questions. Okay, so forget about it. But okay, so you had an answer. So the question is okay. What, uh, let me rephrase the question to make sure that we all understand it. So, right now, we, the way X with six uh, splits the memory is it says, okay, I'll split it evenly bet between the user and systems, right? And system and a kernel, right? So it's first two gigabytes for the user, upper two gigabytes for the kernel, right? You're asking, you ask a question, okay, is it, is it a reasonable split? Because typically the kernel is so tiny, it doesn't do anything, right? We've seen it doesn't do anything. It just executes a system call, executes a system call, maybe has a buffer cache for the file system, but really like immediately returns to the user. And you say, okay, what if my user program is something, a, a database, for example, can we change this number, for example, to, to three gigabytes, right? Because this way uh, I will have, I mean, it's not to scale, but uh, something like this. So you say, then I have uh, three gigabyte for the user and uh, one gigabyte for the kernel, right? It's still the same total four gigabytes, but now you, 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 it seems that you can run larger user applications, right? Uh, if we simply change the kernel, relink it to run at two GBs and load it at, instead of two GBs, load it three, at three GBs, like here, will it allow us to support three GBs of user memory? That's the question I'm trying to ask. Okay, you know negative. So maybe you've seen the, the question in the book. You maybe even knew the where it, is. it was in the book. So, okay, tell us why. Um, I didn't know the book, but in X3 6, we represent all memory that's in that in kernel memory space using the same list. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have enough space in kernel memory, we're not going to be able to map the user memory. Alternatively, we Correct. So what, what your classmate is saying is that with this with this, this organization of a memory allocator, remember that all this physical memory which X 6 is keeping track of is actually sitting here above the kernel in this link list, right? Space to one GB as we did here because we moved the kernel to the three GBs, right? <laughs> the total amount of physical memory which you can keep track of is only one GB at this point. So it actually became less, right? So we used to be, if this stop is set to like four GBs, we would be able to allocate close to two gigabyte of or track and allocate to close to two gigabyte of, of uh, physical memory, right? But in this layout, we only, we only track one, right? 
And so what's this conceptual, how to fix this program, this problem? So what if we want to keep track of 40 bits of, of physical memory and allocate it for whatever, for, 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 whatever, for whatever we need, right, inside the kernel? How will, what's, first of all, what's the conceptual problem here? And you seem to identify it correctly. The problem is that this linked list is sitting here in, in place, which means that we, for every page, we're kind of using the whole page, right? So how well we how 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 can we change it to make sure that it actually works for us? <laughs> we can do what? We can we we can spill to disk. That's one answer, but I, I, I kind of argue that there is a simpler one. Yeah. Uh, instead of using a linked list for every page, right? Because you could have used stack, which is the main address. In this case, more page value. A stack? Yeah. How stack do you stack of free pages? But no, this each of these pages, they they exist in virtual memory, and because we write into them, right, to maintain the linked list. And each page, each virtual page, represents corresponds corresponds to one physical page. So just subtract two GBs, and you get the physical page which you're trying to allocate, right? Uh, uh, the disadvantage is that if you maintain the linked list in place, then that's your organization, right? You only you can only run up to four GBs, right? It's, and it's, if you started from two GBs, you can only account for two GBs of physical memory. But if you change the data structure slightly, then you can account for any amount of physical memory. So how to account? How to keep track? For available physical memory. So okay, let me let me stop here. So is is what I'm trying to ask clear or not? Right? So let me just draw this picture again. So if this is your physical memory, imagine you have four GBs physical. Or oh sorry, like this is physical, starts at zero and goes to four GBs. You obviously have four GBs of virtual as well. Okay, hold on. Not all lines are straight, but almost all of them. I don't know how I can draw such long straight lines. Right? So this is your kernel sitting here at two GBs plus one and B, right? And up until he, up up here, you essentially start creating your link list, right? And what you're doing here is that like this page represents this page, right? So because your kernel sits here, right? That's the end symbol, right? You, we don't even account those pages. We just forgot about them for a sec. But essentially this page, this one, the, is, is a shift of two GBs, right? So whatever this address is, if this is address X, this address, virtual address will be X plus two GBs, right? And that's, that's how we account for available memory, right? And obviously, when you reach the very end of this address space, you are only somewhere here, right? You cannot account for those pages, right? Because you ran out of space here. This is four GBs, right? So there is no address. You can spill over here, but that will introduce additional problems because that's user memory, right? So you, since you're running from the same page table, user and a kernel, user will be able to override this memory, right? So how can we design a better kernel? Correct. So, they agree. So, first of all, don't map them at all, right? Because, right? We, the only what is why? Why do we map them right now? What's the reason? What's the real reason we map them right now? No, almost, but. Partially true, and I mean that's true answer, but for you here, like related to the memory allocator, why do we map them? Exactly to keep track because for whatever reason we decided that we will maintain the link list inside the pages themselves, right? In order to update these pointers, we have to the page has to be mapped, right? So essentially, like when you write here. 
the right goes here, right? And the right goes here, the right goes here, right? And uh, it's just to make sure that this list exists, right? We say, okay, if we don't map, which is a great idea, we, we are not limited by this max address, right? What, what we're going to do instead? Correct. So what we do instead, we say, look, let's just like either allocate a bitmap here and we can allocate it either dynamically in the first two pages or have a static variable. And it's a bitmap, for example, of for uh, 4 million entries, right? Because 4 million bits, because we a total, total number of physical memory we want to track is uh, 4 million roughly, right? Because it's 4, 4 GBs divided by Oh, sorry, not 4 million, 1 million. 4 GB is divided by 4K. So just 1 million entries, right? And then that, that's your allocator, right? You say, look, I simply will be scanning, instead of doing the link list to allocate a page, I will scan this bitmap and I will like find the first unused bit, right? The disadvantage is that it's a linear scan, which means, okay, yeah, that screw it, right? So it will not run fast. The advantage is that you can support all all four GBs, right? Is that clear or is it too? Okay, <coughs> the obvious optimization on top of uh, a bitmap, just to say, look, let's maintain an array of, I don't know, like of 1 million entries, but which are not bits, but I don't know, like numbers, right? So numbers from zero to the total number of pages which you have can have is one mil, right? So roughly speaking, you can have each element to be four bytes if you don't care about, you know, saving space because to maintain one mil, you only need what, 20, 20 bits, right? But here I say, uh, let's use just 32 bits over four bytes. And then instead of a bitmap, maintain a linked list. So just your head will be just a number saying, okay, my head points to page number 77, 77 entry in the array. And here there will be a next element on the list, like five, right? But it's only 32. 32 bits, right? So four bytes, and that's your link list. So you gain you gain ba back all the advantages. And this memory is not map because you don't really need to access it. You once in a while need to access it when you have to, uh, when you create a process and you need to access something on a different page table. And at this point, you can temporarily map a page, right? And that solves the problem. Is it clear? Too much of a detour? Okay, just wanted to make sure that we understand this kind of quirk in, uh, in X with six, not ideal, but fine. As you say, maybe to simplify the code, I agree with this. Okay, so we got the memory allocator. That's uh, that's good from our main. What, el what else do we need to do in main? Create a page table. Uh, why do we need a page table? Correct. So, no, like you have to work backwards. And this is how typically systems are built. They are all built kind of backwards. The end goal is to run processes, right? So, let me just uh, make this drawing for you. And everything is just after you boot it. So, boot was kind of like, and boot is also backwards if you think like your goal is to boot into main, right? So, and then you work out uh, the problem here, essentially saying, okay, I'll do whatever I need to boot into main. But here, your backward reasoning is that I want to run multiple processes, right? So I want to run some kind of ELF file here. And I want them to be isolated, remember? So one process cannot read memory of another process. So this is process P1, this is process P2. Uh, they cannot access each other's memory. And the way we achieve it, so, and again, like if we were, if we would, I would be teaching uh, an advanced operating system class, I would probably introduce multiple ways to achieve this isolation. So in this class, and this is what's typically used in practice, we just use the page table. So essentially we say, look, each of these guys will have a page table, right? So it's kind of clear that each process has a page table, which maps those pages, right? Into available physical pages, right? So essentially, uh, if you have a, you have some physical memory here. So this page 
for example, can be mapped somewhere here by this page table, right? CR3. And maybe this page, which is like consecutively the same page number two in this address space, right? Uh, maybe mapped somewhere else, right? That's kind of a high level picture and you all should understand. Yeah, this, is, this is what the page table is doing. It just allows you to create continuous address space here, right? It might have gaps, but like most of the time we want something continuous because the stack grows continuously, the data and, uh, and the tax action grows continuously, right? But the page table allows you to say, look, I like it just provides the mapping, right? And by the way, isolation, because as you say, if you write into this second page here, it will land on a physical page here. If you write in a, on this into the second page in process P2, it the write goes into this into this uh, physical page, just because the hardware blindly follows the translation, right? Do we still remember the lay layout of a page table? Yeah, because you created a couple of those, right? So they, conceptually, page tables is just it's just a mapping, right? From from virtual to physical, right? The hardware take, takes the virtual address as an input and uses the page table to produce a physical address, right? So that's if if this is this thing on the screen is your end goal, right? So that's not. Got it. The moment I can construct an address space, meaning that I can construct a page table, I will be able to create abstraction of a process, uh, which might have a pointer to this root of the page table, right? So and another process will be here. This one is P1 and this one is P2. Uh, and at this point, you say, look, if I'm building an operating system, I'm very, very close to what I want. So I just uh, say, I know how to construct error spaces. At this point, I will, again, use a little bit of ELF loading magic. So I would have some kind of a disk driver, which a piece of code in the kernel, which allows me to read a disk, or maybe it's a different device. Maybe it's a, an SSD, like, or a slightly different protocol, but you know, you're close enough. But essentially, what you read and write here is 512 blocks of memory. And essentially you say, look, I, I can implement a tiny ELF loader, which essentially loads my data from a disk into my address space. And the way you do that is that you say, look, uh, I kind of like just read the disk. And if I already allocated the pages, that stuff just shows up here, right? And if you, if you don't want to mess with uh, linking and dynamic linking and stuff like that, you just make sure that all your processes, all your binaries on disk are actually linked and loaded to run from address zero, right? Then you just, for example, or from some static address, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, and that's essentially you say, look, I, by the way, I'm so nice that I will implement something what is called POSIX, right? That's what we were talking about the whole time. So which means I have fork and exact system calls, right? And exact is the exact is the one which just loads from disk and fork just clones the process, right? And uh, you say, I'm, I'm very close to, to be running this, but uh, what I still need is that, which is a little bit surprising here, because you, you think that uh, the file system is only used for the for the users, right? Who do open files and stuff like that. But really you say like, since I, my, the kernel itself actually loads the files from disk, right? So it, it's nice to give them names, right? And so that's why you essentially, inside exact, you have something like load me a file, which is user bin ls, for example, right? And the operating system actually, you say, look, I, I better build some kind of a notion of a file system in, in the kernel, which essentially allows me to, like we discussed last time, resolve this human readable name with slashes into something what represents a file or unnamed file on disk, which we call an inode, right? And uh, inode essentially keep track, like essentially logically byte zero in a file is, is in block 75 on disk. And that's your data structure, right? And the moment you have those file system functions, you essentially can load stuff in memory, right? And at this point you say, look, I, I get it. So I, I can construct address spaces. Uh, my only other goal at this point is to be able to switch between them, right? 
And what do we need to switch between the address spaces or between the processes? If we want to run multiple processes in general, like your, your operating system might not even need to switch between them. You might say, okay, sure. I will just simply run one and just bundle everything in one. So how would you do that? If you say like, okay, forget it. I don't want to deal with the context switch. I'll just run one process. Well, that's if you want to switch, right? You want to interrupt. But sometimes you say, look, I don't want to switch. Like many of you probably were on those uh, FLL competitions, like first Lego League and what, what is the, the next one where you build a simple robot, right? And I, uh, yeah, maybe I don't, I seriously doubt that you have a context switching on that operating system, which you were using uh, for that robot. So what you were doing instead? Don't remember? Well, wait, what I'm trying to say is that it's kind of similar to um, if you don't if you don't want to support context switching between processes, right, then you may say that uh, your program, which you're running on this system, which you boot it into, is implemented as a polling loop. And it just like invokes some kind of handlers periodically, right? And it, it kind of rot works so you can like, this is how your Adreno system works. Like you can read a sensor um, and, and react and, and do some kind of a like, you know, like I have to steer a wheel, for example. And if everything, if you have enough time in this loop, then everything is fine. So the robot is moving. If suddenly here you say, well, like compute a route and your route computation, because someone else wrote it and didn't know that, you know, like your tight budget takes like, you know, 100 milliseconds, you know, at this point, you know, you suddenly, you didn't turn the wheel and you ran off a cliff or ran off this, uh, whatever the competition board you're using, right? And at this point you say, okay, maybe that's not the best execution model because if this one takes long, so from 10, 100 milliseconds to one second, maybe we want to actually preempt this computation with something more critical, kind of like maybe this read sensor is uh, reacts on an obstacle in a course, right? And at this point, we say, look, that's, let's, let's make sure that computations are preemptable. And at this point, you introduce a timer and you say, no matter what's happening, I will receive a timer interrupt, for example, every 10 milliseconds, right? And then even if you're in the middle of this computation here, the timer interrupt comes in, your interrupt handler gets control, timer, interrupt. And then you say, look, I, by the way, I know that I have to read the sensor. Otherwise, I will run off the cliff, right? That's essentially the logic for the interrupt. So it's kind of like allows you to preempt, preempt long running computations and make sure that you can react fast, fast to something, right? Agree with this? And then uh, that's what you're doing here. You say, look, I, by the way, in my main function, I will initialize the interrupts as well, right? So you have a memory allocator And your second most important thing is interrupt. So, and uh, who can remind me, how does the interrupt work on x86? Correct, but okay. I mean, it's good. It's clear that you understand interrupt well. Like, yeah, that that's that's very good. So, but conceptually, it just uh, it works like this. There is a, a table which the operating system maintains. It is called interrupt descriptor table or IDT, right? And each interrupt has a number and number of an interrupt corresponds to the entry in this table, right? So if your timer interrupt is interrupt number 32, this entry in the interrupt descriptor table allows you as an operating system developer 
de developer to configure an entry point for the interrupt, interrupt handler. Right? So conceptually, it's very, very simple, right? Essentially, the hardware says, okay, whatever, whatever was running before me, it doesn't matter, right? But the moment I receive in, in 32, I will start executing this handler. And as you said, in order to return from an interrupt, you have to remember where you were. Because right now, if you simply just, just jump to the entry point, it doesn't help you to return because you don't really know where you were, right? So the hardware pushes this on, on a stack, right? And depending on whether you're running uh, already inside the kernel or in a user, so it will push either on the same stack or on a different stack, but it will push on the kernel stack, right? Right, which says, okay, I will push some state here, which represents the state of the program which was running before the interrupt, right? And it will jump to the handler and I will configure the stack pointer to point to this handler, to, to point to this to this stack, right? And this this is how you essentially can return from an interrupt. Kind of very similar to a return from a function, right? So it's it's almost the same, right? But it's just the hardware kind of invokes the, the handler. So if you think of a handler as of a function, so there is a specific calling convention and people call it interrupt calling convention, right? So some languages try to support it, but it's it's a little awkward anyway. So most likely this entry point is always written in assembly. It's just easier this way. And then you jump to C, right? But essentially with you say, okay, I, I have, I, I know how to construct address spaces. I know how to handle interrupts. At this point, I'm kind of, I'm golden. I can I can start running. And the way, remember just how we boot. So essentially, if we started booting, let me just go down here. If we started booting and jump to the kernel, right? And um, it's it's one it's one thread of execution, right? So essentially, your instruction pointer EAP was first set to point to seven C zero zero, right? And then it was just uh, running inside the boot block. Then it jumped into the kernel, which we actually allocated in the, we moved it to two GBs uh, plus one MB, right? It was running in a kernel in the main function of a kernel, right? And at some point you say, look, I will just enter the function, which is called a scheduler. And I forget exactly the name, but let's say scheduler. But the high level idea is that the scheduler uh, will look at a list of processes, all, all like in x 6 is just an array, right? So all the procs, all the processes in the system. And the scheduler will, in an infinite loop, will start looking at these entries and say, okay, are you ready to run? <coughs> and if the process is ready, at this point we say, well, we'll switch to this process, right? Essentially making sure that we switch to the page table of, it, of this process, right? So CR3 will be pointing to, to, the, to the page table of, it, of this process. Uh, the stack or the kernel stack, kernel stack will be pointing to the kernel stack of this process, right? So because the scheduler has its own stack here, uh, because it's like, it's the same, it's the same main function which runs here, right? And at some point we create enough data structures, which we call the trap frame and a context here on this, on this stack, on this kernel stack, that eventually when you start returning from this stack, you reach the instruction, which is IRAT, return from an interrupt, and this IRAT will pick up the last five four byte entries from the stack and essentially return into the user program, right? So maybe it's a it's an entry point in the user program, right? Which we created. And it this user at this point we switch the privilege levels, we switch from the kernel to the user, but essentially this is how you start executing here in the user after this first IRAT, right? So that's how it kind of connects from the very beginning of the boot to the to how you start running the very first process, right? And this very first process was was a little bit ad hoc, so it was a like a, just uh, we didn't use exact to create it. We instead just said, okay, we're going to use this mem CPI and copy this memory, which is less than one page, which essentially immediately this very first process just invokes the exact system call to 
create an init process in a system, right? And after that, it, it goes like that. So, you know, you, you keep running in, inside the process once in a while, either the process uh, exits into, into the kernel with a system call and, for example, blocks it and yields the CPU, triggering a context switch back to the scheduler. And the scheduler, like, again, like, picks up an X entry in this list and switches to this next process. Or a timer interrupt arrives and forces you, the process to uh, use the CPU, essentially, context switching to another process in the same manner, right? And uh, that's the whole point. So essentially, let me just visualize it slightly differently, just to make sure that we all understand it. Uh -huh. So you running inside one process, executing some instructions. So this is the address space of, for, for example, P1, right? The first of all, if timer interrupts arrives, it just forces you in the First of all, it forces you in the address space of the kernel. It's the same address space, the same page table. So it, it hasn't yet changed, right? But it changes your privilege. So if here your current privilege level is zero, sorry, pardon, three, right? The least privilege. Here it's current privilege level zero, right? You start into executing int handler, int 32 handler, right? You start executing here, right? And at this point, you say, look, I will switch the address space, so essentially. But first of all, you what you do is you switch to the scheduler, which runs here, right? And you run into in the scheduler. Scheduler picks the next process, right? So this essentially switches the address space, so it switches the page table to make sure that this address space is ready. And this instruction in the scheduler, which of course exists somewhere here, right in the kernel, it exists in this address space because we, we map the, like the entire kernel in all address spaces, right? So the scheduler continues running here in the next instruction, so but in a different address space. And at this, at some point, as you say, like, okay, I got it. I reached the point when I do an IRAT, and IRAT starts running here, right? And all of it is one. All these address spaces are in one physical memory, which is just shared between these processes just because we map the pages slightly differently, right? So essentially, so you say this page is mapped here, this map is, this page is mapped here, but this page, which contains this scheduler, which is a kernel page, is mapped in both address spaces. It map, is mapped to the same physical page, right? Like this, right? And that's why it works, right? Agree? Okay, so any questions about so kind of my goal was to kind of like walk over it again because if if you look at it in isolation you may be you're losing the big picture here but that's the big picture so essentially your goal is to start running processes l files which you load from disk into address spaces right you do a little bit of trickery to connect everything together the trickery is that you you map the kernel in every address space of every process right so this orange part is always the same and it's the same set of pages right meaning that this page here and here it's the same address right and it's the same one physical page here right and essentially at some point interrupts or system calls or yield will force you into the switch code and the switch code will switch the address space and you can switch between between processes right question um so i, I just want to as long as the user type into the interrupt, the C CPL is switched um, automatically. Right. It, it is switched automatically in so hardware. So before into all trap function. Correct. And it do you know why? Switched. Right. Why? Do you know why? I, I only know it, it will reference from the GD. Correct. So GDT itself, not, not GDT. The IDT will contain something. This entry in the IDT will, call, will will contain a code segment. So when you when the interrupt arrive arrives, so something like interrupt number thirty two, this code segment chooses an entry in GDT, right? And this entry in GDT, this entry will be the one with privilege level zero. That's how it gets switched. 
And uh, yeah, actually, I was I was sitting with one of you uh, the other day trying to figure out like I was asking those extra extra creative questions, and one of the assignments kind of like change the privilege level of the interrupt descriptor to something and see what happens. Well, yeah, it's interesting. Not not always as predictable as you as you would imagine. So you have to carefully read the manual. But again, I it's me. It's less important at this point. So what's important is to understand that this switch happens like this. So if this code segment chooses the entry here, so for example, this code segment chooses entry number five, this is entry number five, and here this, the privilege level here will be zero. So this is how you switch from three to zero. And when you do an IRAD, since the current code segment, which you had on the CPU, gets saved on the stack, on the kernel stack, right? It's pushed by the hardware. When you do an IRAT instruction, you resume to that to that privilege level. Any other questions? So I skipped a little bit uh, just uh, to make it simpler slightly, but uh, one additional bit which X26 is doing is it actually initializes other CPUs, right? So. If this was your boot CPU, right? At some point, this boot CPU sends interrupts to other CPUs. Remember, in each of these CPUs, each of these other CPUs, they kind of wake up and they start booting as well. And the boot sequence is very similar, right? It, instead of like starting from main, it starts with this function MP multiprocessor enter right MP enter since this boot CPU has its own interrupt descriptor table this CPU is does, doesn't yet have anything right so what you have to initialize you have to initialize the segments and you have to initialize interrupts and uh, the reason who can tell me the reason why do CPUs have private interrupt descriptor tables? I kept asking it before, but like, because you say, I, I want to execute interrupt, uh, timer interrupt every time, and every time like a timer interrupt is, is raised, so interrupt number 32. There is a hardware register, which is called interrupt descriptor table register, IDTR, and you say, wow, well, maybe IDTR can point to this on each CPU, IDTR, can point to the same interrupt descriptor table because like, I still want to execute the same code, right? But that's not how it's done. And each CPU will have its own, uh, will have its own interrupt descriptor table, I think, let me double check. Okay, yeah, you're right. So what, what we're saying is that since the CPUs will choose different processes to run, maybe this one is running P1, this one is running P2, and this one is running P3, for example, right? They will run in, in, in this, like, concurrently at the same time, right, in physical time. When the timer interrupt arrives, we need to make sure that the kernel stack is different on each of these CPUs, right? So like we should choose a kernel stack which is which corresponds to the to the to the specific process we're running, right? And uh, what is the connection between the interrupt descriptor table and the and the GDT, right? So what's the connection? We know that uh, okay, it's a little important, so let's just spend a second on it. Uh, let me just draw a picture here. We know that there is a specific uh, table, and I mean, it's again, it's hard to lose track of it because there's there are so many details. The table is called TSS, Task State Segment. The TSS contains information about the stack. Roughly speaking, this is your pointer to your kernel stack, right? So definitely, if we want on each CPU, we, we want to have a private instance of a stack. 
we want to we we need to have a private instance of a tss right agree and if we want a private instance of a tss the question is that how do we even find the tss and we find it from the interrupt descriptor table right there is this essentially there is another register which is called task segment which is like again like let's say entry seven so it chooses entry seven from the from the ADT. Hmm? Oh, ba, ba, ba. yeah, correct. Sorry. GDT, right? So GDT, and this one will have a pointer to the TSS, right? Which means that IDT actually is the same, right? So we don't need to have a per CPU IDT, right? We only need a per CPU GDT because this pointer has to be unique per CPU, right? IDT itself chooses the code segment here. Code segment goes and like picks something like, imagine this is like five, it picks entry number five here. And most of these entries are the same, just this entry number seven, which corresponds to CSS or whatever the number is, has to be private, right? Is that clear? So again, so my figure is then is slightly different. So essentially, Instead of uh, having private IDTs, no, I think I think actually IDT can be the same on every CPU. So let's just me let's, let's just clean up a little bit. So let's just understand. It's kind of important to understand uh, how many of these data structures we are using. So I think that we can use one single IDT. Uh, and let's double double check with the code in a second. So on every CPU, IDTR can point to the same to the same interrupt descriptor table, right? IDT. But GDTs will be private, right? So because you say my my GDT here has to point to a private instance of a TSS, right? Let me just move out a little. And this private instance of the TSS will point to a private instance of a kernel stack, right? That will be the essentially the the layout of the data structure. So I will, if I copy them like this, Control C, Control V. Show you again. So that will be the layout. So on each CPU, you will have your own. Uh, you'll have your own uh, pointer to the global descriptor table register. Like global descriptor table register will contain a pointer to GDT, right? GDT will be private because it needs a a private pointer to the t to a private TSS, and TSS will have a pointer to kernel stack, right? But IDT is the same, I believe. Do you think I'm wrong? The kernel code is shared, so it's a single because it's again each CPU will have will run on a private instance of a page table. It's not strictly required because the kernel part can share the page table, but they will map this page into the same physical page, right? So this this IDT is here, and this is what we this is what we see here. So if we uh, so six public, um, maybe I'm wrong here, but let's just quickly make clean, grab MP, enter. <laughs> What MP enter is doing, we initialize uh, seg init, we initialize the segment, segments were the seg init. Maybe a better way to reason about it is to take 
a look at the CPU data structure and uh, say, okay, look, I, 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 let's, I know that my, my CPU will contain everything what is specific to, to an instance, instance of a physical CPU, right? And so if we take a look at the CPUs, okay, where is it defined? Uh, MP. Where? MP. Yeah. It doesn't look like. Uh, so what I'm trying to find is I'm trying to to grab for the definition of the CPU data structure. Struct CPU. That's a good idea. Grab. Improvidage. So what it has here is that it says, okay, it will have a it will have its private GDT. So, and if we if we say and we say again, edit. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, what I wanted to show you that the GDT is private, so it's connected to the CPU data structure. And if we open uh, main.c again and we take a look at MP enter and we say what is that seg in it. So it initializes this. Uh, it initializes the private per CPU GDT, right? And uh, the key part here is actually not even here, but uh, when we do a switch, uh, if we well, let's do. If we and I think it's switch uh, switch what switch KVM to make uh, to the function which essentially just switches the kernel virtual memory. Oh, that's mine. Probably my implementation of a switch, which is not good. This one. different switch. But I wanted to show you how TSS gets initialized. So essentially, um, so it's either this one, so no, not this one is just switch UVM. So this code. So switch UVM is called as part of the switch, right? And so essentially it says, okay, on this CPU, I know where my GDT is, right? And on this CPU, I will load this entry in the GDT, which corresponds to the TSS with my private copy of this TSS, right? Which is, again, comes from my CPU, right? And in this TSS, I will initialize the, the kernel stack location, which corresponds to the currently running, to the process to which I'm switching, right? That's what I wanted to... Uh, wanted to make sure that we, we understand right so that's 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 the thing which i wanted to to emphasize and if we want to take a look at how interrupts are initialized grab uh, uh, if we go if we edit main again so the trap vectors are initialized with this function tv in it trap vectors in it and if you grab for the tv so the question is like uh, how do we when is that we load the uh interrupts into the into the actual register so it's done with this uh instruction load idt right and now uh, 
we have to execute it on every CPU, LIDT, right? To make sure that, okay, sir, so we initialize the IDT. We only we only use it uh, from this function IDT init. So if we, if we grab for this IDT init, we'll see how the interrupts are initialized on every CPU. So they are initialized in this MP main function, right? So right before entering the scheduler, right, on every CPU we will enter this MP main function and MP main function. And this MP main function essentially, right before entering the scheduler, will in initialize the interrupt descriptor table. So, but it will be the same interrupt descriptor table because we just seen how it works. So this is the one, it's a global IDT which is defined which is defined here in this file as well. So it's a single IDT, but then each CPU has its private GDT, private TSS, and obviously each process has its private kernel stack. And every time we switch between the process, we, we reload the TSS to make sure that we point to the right kernel stack, right? So that, that was my point here. Okay, so three minutes left, so... Let's take some some last minute questions. I think the arrow GDT points to a TSS is upside down. It should be TSS would point to the selector. To what? GDT. No, like the connection is that GDT has an entry. This entry is similar to how we select code segment, data segment. There is a register which is called TS, task segment. This task segment is essentially points, selects an entry from the GDT, right? And GDT itself, like every other segment, normally we configure segments with a base of zero and, uh, and the limit of four GBs, right? But this one will be actually configured with the base. This base will be pointing directly to, to TSS. That's why the arrow goes like this. Right. So like when you when the CPU fetches the TSS, it will follow this translation. So essentially it will add the base. So like and the base will come from here. Okay. I, I thought TSS would be referenced by another register. No, the, the connection goes like this. So TS is Okay, let me show you again. So I don't know if we, uh, when we were doing this switch. Mm. So this is this, this instruction load task register essentially says, okay, the following entry, which is sec TSS, which I don't know the number. Entry number six, right? No, oh, maybe it's actually I'm wrong. Maybe it's not six. Uh, number actually number five. Entry number five in the global descriptor table will contain the task segment, right? And here we load the same entry in the GDT entry number five or sec TSS to have the base of this, of the address of TS, right? And TS is just a location in memory for this CPU. So that's that's one example when the base of a segment is not zero. Yep. Yeah. Okay, maybe read this code again. And so uh, if you are confused, uh, um, so here the seg tss is just there is a slight description here in the book for uh, for, for how it runs so this is the references from the book so any any other any other questions So this is this is kind of this is important, but it's not super important. But it's important to understand how we run multiple CPUs, right? Uh, 
right? And that's what I wanted to emphasize here. So essentially, it's almost the same. So the same, the same stuff is running on each CPU, the same context switch, right? The same memory is shared between between like the same kernel memory shared on all CPUs, right? That's why you need to synchronize with spin locks and stuff. But the layout of data structure is like this. So all good for now. So I'll see you then. Uh, I'll see you then when uh, on Friday actually at eight. So or during my office hours at least today at one if you need help. With me. I'll try to answer a lot of questions on Piazza if you ask them. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what's up? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if we have a review session or something like that. That was the review session. This is? Yeah. I mean, well, we don't discuss any actual classes. We will not, yeah. Oh, okay. So you have to go through the exams. Okay. okay. And uh, discuss the questions. That okay. Will, that's, that's the last one. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a question because I, I saw it from all points. And what is the error means from a TSS point? Yeah, so, so this is, uh, that's a bug in the slide. So it should oh. be the other way. Oh, so, so my the, slides the are buggy. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. okay so, no, you're right. That's that. Yeah, good, good, good job catching it. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. I understand that the extra homework is a little bit longer because I have an exam uh, on next Wednesday. So I really want to try it. But, uh, yeah, we probably other. can. Yeah, we probably can because we still have some time for the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>